Right, so we have seen some examples of how malloc can be used in order to allocate memory and then to access it and use it, right. One of the things that would be interesting for us is if we can use what are called multidimensional arrays, right. The simplest idea concept of a multidimensional array would be something like a matrix. Now, how exactly would we store a matrix in the memory corresponding to a computer, right? And the problem that we are trying to solve is, we have a data structure, the data that we want to store is a two dimensional array, but our memory is fundamentally one dimensional. There is only low memory to high memory. I do not have a second dimension that I can go sideways, okay? So what do I do? I find that, you know, I will basically unravel this matrix, right? That's the simplest way to do it. One way to do it would be, you know, I have all these elements out here, why not just take them row by row and store them in, in the memory. And that's pretty much what C does, right? It basically flattens out the matrix and says A00 goes here, then A01, A02, then A10, A11, A12, then A20, A21, A22. So all the elements that were present over here get stored into a linear memory right, by flattening out the rows, okay. Now, as you can imagine, there are two ways of doing this. One of them is to go row by row and the other would be to go column by column, right. And the question of course then arises, which is the correct way to do it? And the answer is, there is no correct way. Both are perfectly valid choices. C makes the choice that it will go in what is called row major format. Right, which is that the rows get stored as adjacent values. So A00, A01, A02 are going to get stored in adjacent memory locations. After that, the next row A10, A11, A12 gets stored, then A20, A21, A22. Other programming languages, most notably Fortran, choose the other option. They basically say A00, A10, A20 will be stored first, then I'll go to A01, A11, A21, A02, A12, A22. Right? And that's called column major format. As I said, there's no fundamental right or wrong over here. Where you run into problems is, you could have an issue when you go from one data that was stored in one language and you try reading it in another language. That is typically where you start having problems. Or let's say that you have a function that has been written and compiled from one language and you're trying to call it from another language. You could do that because after all, both of them now corresponding, correspond to instructions of your CPU. The problem is the data conventions that they use are different, okay? So if I choose the row major format approach for storing data, then basically what it says is that indexing, right? I can write code in C that looks like this, A of I of J, right? So basically what it says is A of I corresponds to the ith row and of j corresponds to the jth column within that row. And effectively what we are saying is that is a sort of short form for this notation, which is that I start with the pointer for a, I take the i, that is the offset in terms of the number of rows over here, multiply that by c, which is how many columns are present in each row, right? So for example over here, if I look for i equal to 2, what I would do is I would multiply that 2 by column, one set of columns, another set of columns so that I get to this offset point out here, right? And then I take the offset j, which is that I basically go from here and from here I basically offset into the particular row, right? So that's what is being done by this formula. It says that if I have c columns, each row basically corresponds to C number of elements. So when I want to go to the ith row, I need to multiply by C so that I've got to the correct offset. And from there, I need to move inwards by J to get to the correct column, right? So by using this approach, essentially C is able to take two dimensional arrays and convert them into a one dimensional memory axis. Right? Of course, in order to do this, you need to realize that the compiler or whoever it is that's generating these addresses for you needs to know C, right? the number of columns, which means that this kind of notation actually only works 
for something that has been declared in such a way that the compiler knows exactly what it is that is the size of the array. The compiler can then keep track of the number of columns and make use of it appropriately. Now you could have another approach to store two dimensional arrays, right, which we will look at in terms of a piece of code, which is that I could say that let me treat every row in my matrix as an int star, as an array of integers, right. And what I will do is I will take int star star, which is a pointer to an array of integers and more importantly star star a would be a pointer to an array of pointers or rather it is an star star a would be an array of pointers, right. It is not a pointer to an array of pointers, it is an array of pointers by itself. Right? So, star star a is an array of pointers, which means that one element in star star a, right? if I was to dereference by one level, I would get an array of integers. And if I dereference to the second level, I would basically be able to pick up an individual element somewhere in one row corresponding to the data. Okay? This is also one way by which you can store data. As we will see later, it does not guarantee that your the data that you allocate all ends up being in consecutive memory locations, right? But it is still valid, especially for large matrices, this might be one way by which you can do the allocation. Now, we need not stop at two dimensions, right? It is entirely possible to go further, right, to multiple dimensions. I could, for example, declare a variable as int a of 2 of 5 of 10, right? What this effectively says is there are two planes, right, for want of a better word, right. And each of those planes has a matrix which has 5 rows and 10 columns. So, that is what the 5 and 10, the second part of it corresponds to, okay. Which means that the i, j, kth element in A can be found by using this formula, right. What does i correspond to? It is the index in the plane dimension. How many elements are there in each plane? R into C, where R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. So that is my offset to get to the ith plane. After that, in the ith plane, I need to go to the jth row. For that, I need to multiply by the number of elements present in each row. So J into C. And once I have got the offset of the particular row, I can go and find the kth element over there by just adding that many elements into it, right. So, in general, any kind of multidimensional array can be handled in C, provided that it is statically declared like this with known uh, maximum index values, right. The compiler will be able to take care of all of these formulas internally and you can use this notation. If you do not know the sizes of the matrices ahead of time, you will probably have to explicitly perform this computation by yourself, right. But either way, C as a language can be used in order to also implement multidimensional arrays. Let us look at some examples next. So, here we have an example of a two-dimensional array that has been declared and initialized at once, right. And if you look at the initialization, you will see that, you know, it is sort of an extension of the syntax that we use for initializing arrays. Here, clearly what we have done is we have got nested arrays, right. So, inside the outer curly brackets, we have inner curly brackets that contain the elements corresponding to each of the rows, right. There are two rows. So, there are two sets of curly brackets out here, each of which contains five elements. So, pretty much everything here has been initialized. How do I access the nth, the ij element out here? I can just write a for loop right, which basically says, okay, print, you know, a of i of j, right, and let us see what happens when I run that, right. And you can see that the 0, 0th element is 1, 0, 1th element is 2, etc., 1, 0th element is 6. So, that is row 1, column 0, and up to row 1, column 4, which has the value 10, right. Now, the other interesting thing that you can see over here is what happens if instead of printing the value, I actually print the address of the ijth element, right. What do we expect that to be? Let us 
look at it, right? And it's clear enough, right? The 0-0th element is at something 1552. The 0-1th element is at 1556, which is plus 4, 1560, 1564 and 1568. Now comes the 1-0th element, right? What should I do for getting to the next row? I need to add, how much is it? I have 5, my column size is 5, right? The integer size is 4, so I need to add 40 bytes or 40 address locations. No, sorry, not, not uh, 40, uh, 5 into 4, that is 20 address locations. Let's see, my starting address for 0, 0 was some 1552 plus 20 is 1572, which is exactly the address that I find for 10, right? And from there I go 76808488. Now this 1572, by the way, is just 1568 plus 4. So in other words, it's a continuous block of memory that has got allocated for this A25, right? Pretty much exactly what we expected it to be. Now, just for completeness, we can also look at, you know, what happens if I just take an int star b, give it the address of a, right? And can I directly do an address lookup like this, i into 5 plus j, right? Let's try running it. And sure enough, we find that b of 0, plus, 0 into 5 plus 0 corresponds to a of 0, 0, right? So every one of these values, the 0 into 5 plus 4 corresponds to a of 0, 4, right? I have printed these values out, but you can go and check exactly the math that's being computed out here, right? So basically what it's telling you is, in other words, that formula that we had looked at earlier for computing the index is exactly what is being applied over here as well, right? You could have changed this around and written it as star of b plus i into 5 plus j as well, right? And sure enough, you find that, you know, even by using this dereferencing notation that we have over here, we get back exactly the same values. Not a surprise, but good to verify that, you know, the formula that we had in mind was correct. Now, what about a multidimensional array, right? What we can see over here is if I go ahead and declare something as short of S33, right? This is basically a three-dimensional array. And what I would like to do is to actually print out the value of each and every element that I have out here, right? I have three nested for loops, i, j, k, which allows me to access the s of i of j of kth element, take its address and print it out. What happens when I run this? You can see that, you know, the 0000th element is at some location 8752. These are shorts. So the next one is at 8754, 8756, right? So that's the first three elements. After that, I go to 10 and that goes in 8758, then 8760, etc. So in other words, if as I go through this, I can find that, you know, this sort of verifies that I have actually used the row major format, right? The rightmost index is the one that is varying the fastest. It is the one which basically takes me from one location to the next. The leftmost index is the one which, you know, varies the slowest out here. You can see that, you know, this leftmost index remains the same for all of these values, right? All that is happening is that formula is being used. It's not that there is any specific pattern being done over here. It's just using that formula. And as a result, we end up directly accessing the locations in series. So this is how a multidimensional array gets implemented. You can increase this as much as you want. It doesn't really matter. So finally comes the question of what happens if I want to create a matrix or a two-dimensional array and I don't know the size ahead of time, right? The straightforward approach would probably be to say that if I want R rows and C columns, I know that I have R into C elements, just malloc R into C elements, right? And then use the formula in order to figure out the i comma jth element in it. And yes, that works. In fact, it is probably the most efficient way of creating matrices when you are sure that what you are dealing with is a fixed size matrix element. There can be scenarios where the individual elements that you are declaring themselves inside the array have different sizes. 
that happens especially when you are dealing with structs that have arrays inside them and so on. Right? Now what happens in such a scenario is you can go for another approach which is to say I will use a pointer to arrays. Right? So declare a as int star star. What that means is the first dereferencing will actually give me a pointer which in turn points to a list of integers. Right? So how do I even go about creating the memory for this? You need to do it carefully. Right? I first say that I want to allocate r int stars, not r ints, r int stars and take that, convert it into an int star star and assign it to a. a at this point is a pointer to an array of pointers or rather it is an array of pointers. It is a pointer to a pointer, right? Which means I can still access a of i. a of i now is actually a pointer to integers. So what I can do is, now I know that each of these arrays a of i, a of 0, a of 1, a of 2 and so on must in turn point to a set of c integers because there are c integers in each row, right? So I can go ahead and do another malloc. But now its size of int, right? Because after all, ints are what is being stored in the individual elements. C of them, malloc convert to an int star and assign that to a of i, right? And what that means is now I can go ahead and actually say, I can ask for what is the size of a of i. It's basically going to tell me that it's a pointer. But more interestingly, I can also assign values to it as a of i of j. Now look carefully at this notation. This can potentially be a little confusing. It looks like it's a regular 2D array notation, right? The problem is it is not actually using the syntax of i into c plus j in order to find out the location of the ijth element anymore. If you think about what is happening here, what it's actually doing is a of i is an int star. It looks up that location from A, finds a pointer and dereferences that pointer now with J in order to get A of i j. How do we know this? Let us try running it and see what happens. You can see over here that, you know, first thing is that the size of each individual A of i is size 8, which is basically a pointer, right? But let us look at the addresses. Right? So the address of A00 is something ending with 9872. Address of A01 is 9876, 9880. So far so good, they are all just incrementing by 4. I go up to 9888 over here. My expectation would be that address of 10 should be this 9888 plus 4. It is not. Right? It is some other value because when I did this malloc over here, the program did not give me any guarantee that it would pick the next address and assign that to a of 1. It picked some other address, but from there onwards a of 1 of 0, a of 1 of 1, etc. are accessible. All that happens is a of 1 is now a pointer pointing somewhere else and a of 1 of 1 is derived as an offset from that. So two dimensional arrays can also be declared as pointer to pointer. It gets a little bit more confu uh, confusing, but is useful and required when, especially when you are dealing with variable length objects, right? Data structures. In the case of integers, for example, this is most likely not the most efficient way of storing a two dimensional array. You are better off declaring one chunk of data of r into c elements and performing the computation of i into c plus r, j on your own. Right? But this is also another way by which it can be done if required. 